And as Nehemiah stated in chapter 8, verse 10, do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So I challenge each of us to make it about God and his redeeming grace and let the joy of knowing Christ shine through you to others this Christmas season and throughout the year. Thanks. Let's pray. Father God, we carry many burdens and worries over many things. Uh, Circumstances often weigh us down. Help us to hear your promise in this Advent season. And in hearing, may we receive the Spirit's gift of joy. And may our spirits be filled with joy at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, at this time, we will uh, dismiss... I'll take that for you. At this time, we'll dismiss our four-year-olds through fifth grade to Children's Church. All right, and for the rest of us, let's stand as we uh, continue in our worship service this morning. great to be in the house of the Lord with you all this morning, and uh, for those here that aren't familiar with me, I am Doug Nickram, I'm an elder here at Faith, Um, and I'm extremely excited to be here to uh, deliver God's word. We also want to uh, welcome those online viewing today, and um, I trust this morning will be uplifting, and my hope is that 
Almighty God will be glorified this morning. It's amazing uh, in this world today how technology has taken over. It's amazing. I can remember in my college days in the early 1980s when computers were just coming to fruition. The computers I worked with were as big as an average sized bedroom. Computers, to me, the untrained college student, were virtually unusable and very cumbersome to work with. I also recall in my college days manually writing my papers for my assignments on a typewriter and how painstaking that was. And if you made a mistake, well, that was almost impossible for me to correct. I would often have to start over. I, I, what I did was I actually hired someone to type, and I found out, I said, I'm not going to do it. And it just was uh, less stress, and I got it done that way. But who can remember the big VHS video cameras? Do you remember recording those special moments of your families? Well, maybe I'm old, to, maybe you don't. Well, um, they were very cumbersome, and they were hard to use, and to watch them, oh, the end result, the end product wasn't that good either. But you know, as you know, technology has changed, and is forever changing. It's so hard to keep up with. In in preparing for this week's message, it caused me to think of what is being done in the area of technology, specifically the area of video and surveillance. Every day, we're being taped, doing something or going somewhere. We have video capability in so many ways, in so many areas of our lives, our phones, our doorbells, inside our homes, our workplaces, and on the roads and streets that we drive on. All the areas have some type of ongoing video that can track our every move. This video surveillance, like so many other technological advances, can be used for good and evil. We like the ability to watch our sleeping children and grandchildren via a video camera connected to our phone or our computer. We dislike the use of video to trap, abuse, mistreat people on social media. I'm reminded of the 1998 movie, The Truman Show. Has anybody seen that? Starring Jim Carrey. But this movie for me was quite a sad one. I'm not a big movie buff, I'm just not. Uh, But this one was a sad movie. The story is about a kind-hearted insurance salesman and an ambitious explorer named Truman Burbank. And he was the subject of the Truman Show. In the movie, we see a reality TV show produced by Truman's father, Christoph, played by Ed Harris. Harris's character was an all-powerful TV god who directed this extreme 24-7 reality show. Truman was unaware that he was being watched 24-7 by video and was the subject of the show. Everything around him was fake. His wife, his children, his friends, his job, his home, even the roads that he drove on. Christoph, Truman's father, on the show, would plan the show and every move Truman made to enhance the show and to attract more viewers, all of which Truman, Truman was oblivious to. If you haven't seen the movie, I won't spoil the ending for you, but, if you ha- but safe to say, Truman, Truman eventually catches on. In my view, this is a sad story of someone's privacy being taken away from them and being used for evil and entertainment purposes. 
My takeaway from the movie was that Truman trusted his TV show father, and this trust was broken. This father chose evil over love and protection. What an evil premise. This morning, I would like us to this morning I'd like us to explore a book of a book in Psalms what a father's true love and protection is like. During the past three years, we've had some excellent teaching uh, of Pastor Josh. And he's often preached and taught on the book of Psalms. This has touched my heart. I've, I've got a new love and I'm motivated to get into the Psalms and to read them and to apply them to my teaching. I lead a small group. I teach our middle school and high school Sunday school class. And this last couple of years, we've gone to the book of Psalms. As a matter of fact, we're there right now in our high school and middle school class. So the book of Psalms, let me give you a little, little background before we start. In my research, I found that Psalms is a book in the Old Testament composed of sacred songs or of sac- and of sacred poems meant to be sung. The book of Psalm, which is generally believed to be the most widely read book in the Bible and the most highly treasured books of the Old Testament. It is a collection of poems, hymns, prayers that express the religious feelings of Jews throughout various periods of their national history. Psalms were used in connection with worship services conducted in the temple at Jerusalem. Some of them were sung by the pilgrims on their journeys to the central sanctuary for all, some of, for all the faithful who were required to attend services at this place once a year. Some of the hymns would be sung when the pilgrims first came in sight of the city of Jerusalem, and others sang them as they stood before the entrance of the temple. They were songs of praise to Yahweh for his mighty works that he had performed. And they were songs of thanksgiving in the way in which the the Hebrews had been delivered from the hands of their enemies. And other songs were written as in praise of the law. The book of Psalms is easy easy to find. It's, It's situated right in the very center of the Bible. The major themes found in Psalms are praise, God's power, forgiveness, thankfulness, and trust. Uh, one key verse here in uh, the book of Psalms that uh, I'd like to, to uh, talk about is, is Psalm 145, 21. And it kind of gives us the tone and the purpose of the book of Psalms. It says, My mouth will speak of the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. This morning, we will be focusing on Psalm 139. We have a short video of you here to, to present to you right now that it'll, for your view. Wow. He's read that and said that probably better than I could bring this morning. Psalm 139 is amazing. Psalm 139 is challenging. I spoke with Josh this morning and he said, that's pretty challenging, Doug. (laughs) It's like, oh, okay. A lot there. And I I, I agree with him. Um, We find in, in Psalm 139 that it's a personal prayer sung by David. A personal song of praise. This psalm focuses on God's relationship with us as individuals. In reading this psalm, it's hard to pinpoint David's life situation at the time. Some could surmise that this was a period of darkness 
in a challenging time for him. Reaching out to God for mercy, help, and forgiveness. One could also surmise that David may have been in a mountaintop time of his life. A very good period of time. Acknowledging God for who he is and how David's love and reliance upon him was so great. And that his response is an enthusiastic psalm of praise. Either way, David's personal prayer gives us insight on the relationship between God and us and us and God. Psalm 39 deeply and thoroughly reviews and magnifies the relationship between God and his people. This morning, we will be focusing on the character of God and several of his attributes, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, and his omnipotence. Charles Surgeon described, describes Psalm 139 like this. It sings the omnipotence and the omnipresence of God, inferring from these the overflow of the powers of wickedness, since he who sees and hears the abominable, abominable deeds and words of the rebellious will surely deal with them according to his justice. Spurgeon's words will assist us as we uh, try to understand this beautifully written psalm and give us meaningful application. This morning we will be focusing on what I think is our greatest relationship and that's God's relationship to us. The first attribute in God's text that we'll be focusing on is, is omnipotence. God knows everything. We read in Psalm 139, 1 through 6, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted, acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. David shows a profound knowledge and understanding of who God is, the one true God. We see the intensity of his adoration for Jehovah, the all-knowing God. David understands the unlimited height and depth of God's knowledge of him. God knows David, and God knows us. Quoting Spurgeon again, there never was a time in which we are unknown to God, and there will never be a moment in which we shall be on his observation. David outlines specifically how God knows us. When I sit down, he knows when I lie down. He knows where we're going and what we're going to do. He even knows the words we speak, even before we speak them. God's presence is, is everywhere, everywhere. And he knows everything. And uh, I got a snippet from John Piper, and it says this. All of life, down to the tying of shoes and the brushing of teeth, is directed by God. Amazing. Tying your shoes and brushing your teeth. God knows about it. Throughout God's holy Bible, we are reminded of his omnipotence. Matthew 10.30 tells us this. But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. If we, believers, are thinking correctly 
for your discouragement, but it, it could be. The fact is God, God hates sin and wants us to lead a life of service and adoration to him. We should understand what David is saying here, and this should be an encouragement to us, and, and we should be happy about this. In, our, in the Truman Show, uh, unlike Christoph, the father of Truman, Burbank, God loves us and wants the best for us. God is not oppressive towards us. God wants his people, believers in Christ, to passionately seek after him and to love him and to do the work he has called us to do. The fact that God knows everything should allow us to be open and honest with him in all that we do, think, and speak. Allowing us to to come to God like David did, passionately, every day of our lives, knowing that he will guide us and protect us. We see the guidance and protection here in verse 5. It says, You hem me in, behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. We see the term hem, or it could be hedge, or it could be fence in different translations. And we see this term quite frequently in the Bible. My counting is 14 times. Uh, The Hebrew word for hedge or hem is the word to sir. And this word has two meanings. It is, the first meaning is Yahweh makes him secure. And another meaning would be laying siege. In in today's text, this tells us that the psalmist has nothing to fear. That God has a binding protection upon him. In Job 1.10, we find the concept of protection prior to Satan being allowed to tempt Job. God had put a hedge of protection around him. And it reads... Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all he has on every side? We find also in Mark 12, 1, in the parable of the tenants, about the the concept of the protection of God. It reads, a man planted a vineyard and put a fence or hedge around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower. In Psalm 139, 5, we find a key takeaway. That God protected David on every side. The reason he did that was that so nothing could come to David unless it came through God. That's a great concept. That's a great feeling. And we we know that that was true for David And we know it's true for us who trust in the Lord. God is our hedge of protection. God is our protective barrier. We also know that we have nothing to hide or fear under God's gentle hand. God's people, as God's people, we need to cling to our all-knowing, gentle, and protecting God, just as David did. We find also in verse 6 a little bit more about this relationship between God and David and how it's structured. Here, David humbly acknowledges God's omnipotence, saying, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. It says God is all-knowing. It says that God knows David better than David knows himself. Just think of uh, some of your closest relationships. Who are you close to? Hopefully your spouse, your children, some friends. How How well do they know you? You see, I, my close relationship is with my wife, Lori. 
I would hope that we're close, very close. I always say, I like to say that we've been dating for 45 years. It's a fact. We've been dating for 45 years. We have a close and hopefully great relationship. She knows me better than anybody else in this world. And I hopefully know her better than anybody else knows her in the world. We work together. We spend a lot of time together. She's a saint. And uh, when she gets up in the morning, we just have a moment there. And, and when she walks in there, the moment she's there, she knows what mood I'm in. She knows what mood I'm in. And hopefully I know what mood she's in. Um, it often goes like this. She will say, what's wrong? What's interesting about that is that we haven't even spoke yet. She knows immediately there's something bothering me. I too know when she is troubled or concerned about something. We also think alike. Often in our conversations, she and I will be thinking about the very same thing, it's random, at the very same time. It's happened often. We're, we're driving in a car, or we're kind of quiet, and we're thinking about the same thing. I was just thinking about that. Is that weird? <laughs> I, I hope not. I hope that we have this connection and that we're very close. You see, this, this relationship between the husband and wife is so special. It is, it's so special where there's so much known about each other. And for me, it's a, it's a comforting thing. It's a wonderful thing. Um, whether it's good or bad, you know, they see the best of us and say the worst of us, and they still stay with us. And that's a great relationship. But the fact is that God knows us oh so much more. And that's an understatement. The truth is that God knows us better than we know ourselves. How great is that? Uh, verse 6 um, just gives us just a brief glimpse of how wonder, wonderful that is, that God knows us. It tells us that God is all-knowing. And this is a comforting attribute, a reassuring attribute one that we should take a hold of and be honest with God, excuse me, seeking to be the best servants we can be for him. The second attribute in today's text emphasizes God's omnipresence. God is always present, always in all places. We see this in verses 7 through 12. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I bake my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take my wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there you shall lead me. And your, hand, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for the darkness is as light to you. Another major takeaway from this song, we are never alone. We are never alone. Psalm 139, 7 says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Those are two rhetorical questions. They illustrate that we are never moved beyond the reach of God's personal protection. And this is kind of interesting. You know, the rhetorical questions. And as I'm going through this, I, I don't think this is what David is suggesting, that, that we can be hidden from God, Okay. 
I believe that David is crying out and verbalizing his thoughts. Just kind of just thinking out loud. What follows these questions, according to the commentaries that I was reading this week, are four suppositions. They're expressing the extremes of the universe and reinforcing God's basic, or David's basic premise that God is always present, all time and all places. In these four suppositions, you see the places where God is present. Heaven, Sheol, the uttermost parts of the sea, and deep into darkness. We certainly know that that God dwells in heaven, right? Throughout God's holy word, we see that God dwells there. He dwells everywhere, but he dwells there too, and is patiently waiting for us to join him. The contrast to this first supposition is Sheol. Several dozen times throughout scripture, the word Sheol appears in reference to afterlife. We find in the Old Testament that most, the most common way to describe Sheol is the house of death. It is the realm of the dead where the dead go. It may be referred to sometimes as hell. Okay? I like what uh, Matthew Y. Emerson said about Sheol. Sheol is a place of darkness. But it is also a place where God still remembers his people, where, where he is still king, where he is still king. Jonah 2.2 reinforces God's omnipresence in reference to Sheol. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Jonah 2.3 speaks of the depth of God's presence. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and flood surrounds me, surrounded me. All your waves and billows passed over me. David is speaking of God's presence even in darkness. Verse 12 tells us, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day. To David, God's presence is a constant light in the darkness. Much like we read in Exodus 13, 21. And the Lord went down before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead along the way. And and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they may travel Day and night. You see, God was the light in the darkness for the people of Israel. We see also in Job 34, 21. This tells us that God, with God, there is no darkness. That God sees and knows all. Nothing can be hidden from him. We read, for his eyes are upon the ways of a man. And he sees all his steps. There is no gloom or deep darkness where evildoers may hide themselves. God is the light and the darkness for Job and the people of Israel. God is the light and the darkness for us. God is ever present for us. God is our light in the darkness. I like what John 1.45 says about this as well. And this, this gives us a glimpse of what David is talking about in reference to Jesus and God and us being in darkness. I just I love what this said. In him was life. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
How comforting that is. How comforting it is to know that God and his son Jesus, that we have the light and the darkness that we experience in our daily lives. This light shines bright for us as we struggle through these difficult and tough times. God is ever present. God is the light in the darkness. The next attribute of God is his omnipotence, meaning God is all-powerful. That God has supreme power, that God has no limitations. You see, God can do all things. God is supreme. God is limitless. This, this we can't debate. It's, it's undebatable. You just can't. You see, with God, there was no beginning, and there will be no end. Our all-powerful God is the creator of everything. There is nothing in this universe that God has not created. We come to this section, this critical section in Psalm 139, verses 13 through 18. And it's going to help us understand our relationship with God and his role in creating us and his supreme power. This well-known passage paints a lovely picture of God's love for his creation and the people he created. We will see the depth of his creation along with the complexity of of the earthly bodies he has given us. As believers, these words should be near and dear to our hearts as it pertains to God and the life he, he breathed into us. You see, we were created in his image for his purposes. And in this section of scripture, we'll address that that we were created in him image for his purposes even before we were conceived. God has intimately known us and he uniquely created us. Let's read these verses, 13 through 18. For you formed me, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast are the sum of them. If I, if I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. You can only imagine the passion that that David has for God as he's reciting and singing this psalm. We, in these words, we have a better understanding of who God is, the omnipotent creator of all things. I, I still am amazed at maybe seeing him saying these words. Um, there's a word picture that, that I had this week as I'm studying is that he's on his knees, raising his hands in tears, praising God, the all-powerful creator. What David is saying here is astounding, that our all-powerful God had the care and concern to personally form a child in his mother's womb. This tells us a very important fact, that God knew David from before his birth. God knew David before his birth. 
as a child conceived and then developing in the womb. Well-known Bible scholar and preacher David Goodzik puts it this way. The fact that God knows and cares for children in the womb means that God's concern for life begins at conception. It means that God's people have a responsibility to also know and care for, for children in the womb. Some people argue the moral right to have an abortion because the mother has a right to do as she pleases with her own body. Psalm 139 demonstrates that God sees another person in the mother's womb. What David is saying here, that God sees a baby, another person, in the mother's womb. And even, and even before conception, God loves and cares deeply for that person. Let that sink in a little bit. God sees a baby in the womb as another person. This is a key point. This is a key point here. The key point is that we are not God. We cannot and should not play God by taking the life that God created. This is against God's will. This is against God's intentions. One can only imagine the sorrow God feels at the taking of a life the taking of the life of one of his beautiful creations. In this passage, we find two important concepts. First, the wondrous way in which we are created. Secondly, the way God knew all that was going to happen during this process. I love the phrases in this text that David uses to illustrate, to tell us on God, how God created us. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Intricately, wo- intricately woven. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. Amazing, amazing. What a description. You see, David is confident that God created him prior to conception, conception and then to birth. And that God created and designed us with, with a purpose. It's also interesting that uh, we're all unique. That God created us uniquely. Basically, we, we are got the same makeup, but, but we're the same. We're not the same. And that, that's a big praise God. You know, we're all different. We're all different. Um, for me, in this, this entire psalm, the, the verse that sticks out, and the one I just love, it, and it's verse 14. It says, I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. Obviously, I'm not a doctor. Obviously, I'm not a scientist. Pretty simple-minded. But it's obvious that the makeup and design of the human body is very complex. I like what Jennifer Heron wrote in her article titled, What Does It Mean to Be Fearfully and wonderfully made. Her article pertains to the complexity of God's creation, us, meaning our bodies. She states, I didn't just evolve into what I am. I was created and designed with a purpose. And the blueprints 
of me are similar to other human beings, but they are not exactly the same. I am unique, and so are you. The human body is a unique design of multiple systems that work intricately together. The cardiovascular system gives you energy, energy to move. The muscular system gives you the, the ability to move, lift, and hold things. The digestive system processes food into energy and discards waste. The immune system keeps you healthy. The hormonal system determines your gender. The eyes cause you to see. The nose lets you smell. The tongue and mouth let you eat and taste. The ears enable you to hear, and your skin enables you to feel textures. You have the ability to encounter an incredible, diverse world with an equally amazing, diverse body. Then you are blessed with a brain so you can think, process, and create. Isaac Astamov said that the brain is the most complex and orderly arrangement of matter in the universe. Your emotions help you relate to other people and feel compassion. All of these systems, plus many more, were uniquely designed to make you who you are. Wow. Wow. Like I said, I'm not a doctor or a scientist. I, science was my least favorite subject, but it's amazing the makeup of the human body. It's amazing how God created us. He created us by his power. He created us uniquely. He, he created us in his own image. God made us. I like what it says in Ephesians 2.10. Love this verse. Love this verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Let's concentrate on the word made. Let's concentrate on the, the concept of workmanship. This is key here. The Greek word for made, uh, referred to in 139.14, is poema, meaning that which is made a work. Of the work, our workmanship of God as creator. I just love what it says. Um, I truly believe that um, the makeup and the creation of the human body is God's greatest miracle. I really do. This complex creation, man, God made us. He made us in his image. God made us by his breath. Just amazing. Just amazing. Um, another interesting fact and a key point as I studied this week about David, I found this interesting fact. Um, back then, David knew far less than we know right now about how our human bodies are made. Right? And this is, this is a sad situation. Um, 2021, almost 2022, we have a lot of advanced technology. Um, we know so much about the human body, but not as much as God does. But the sad, the sad commentary to this is that it, it seems that even with all our knowledge of the human body, that our society tends not to value God's creation as much as David did years and years ago. This is earth-shattering to me. I often wonder what God thinks of this. In verses 17 through 18, 
David switches gears. As he concludes this section by re- reviewing all of what God knows about him. How precious to me are your thoughts. If I could count them, they are more than the sand. David finds comfort and encouragement in God's care for him. He cannot completely comprehend how wonderful and vast God's thoughts are for him. In this, he finds comfort. And in this, we should find comfort as well. In these verses, 19 through 22, um, there's an abrupt shift from God's thoughts to the thoughts of David about the wicked, those who hate God. We find in these verses that David has anger against the wicked, that, that he is, has a disdain for those who hate God. It reads, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God, O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Pretty intense words there. What an intense prayer against the wicked, those who hate God. I don't think that uh, David's anger is self-serving. I don't think it's personal in nature. David's hatred is directed to those, to those who oppose God. David's love and adoration towards God is the impetus behind his hatred. And I know, I know, you guys are saying, okay, today we can't say we hate people, and, and that's true, that's true. Um, and these statements are probably quite alarming. And some may say that they're contrary to God's word. Well, let's look at First John 4, uh, several verses here. First John 4, 20, Leviticus 19, 17, and Luke 6, 27. First John 4, 4, 4, 20 says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. And then in Leviticus 19, 17, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. And then in Luke 6, 27, but I say to you here, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. We all believe that God's word is true. We all believe that God's word is consistent. David's motivation for his plea in verses 19 through 20. 22, is out of his deep love for the Lord and his hate for anything, anything contrary to God. This is not a conflict in in the teaching of God's word. It's a vivid illustration on how we handle sin, anger, and hate. You see, David's hate for the wicked and those who oppose God is merited. His motivation is from his heart. His motivation is from his love and adoration to an almighty God who created him. We too should hate all that is sin. We too should all oppose the wicked. We too should dislike, dare I say, hate those who who oppose God. But within the disdain of sin, wickedness, and evil, we are to hate the sin, love the sinner. Don't look that up in your Bibles. It's not there. It's not there. Uh, I tried. Um, But we do find in the teachings uh, in Matthew and Luke, 
when it talks about uh, judging, there's passages that says, stop judging. It's not our place to judge. It's God's, right? We are, we are to love those who hate us. And sometimes that's hard to do, right? In our human nature, we were born with it. The propensity to, to, to sin and uh, not hating those who we hate is a difficult thing we do because we in ourselves are sinners. All this to say, we are to hate sin, wickedness, anything that opposes God. And this is what David is telling us. We find at the close of Psalm 139, much, how it, much like how it began, with, with David humbly and heartfelt pleading to God to search him and know him. This is a passionate cry. This is a passionate plea. This is David's response to God. This is David's response to God's character. It says this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And I see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. This should be our plea as well. In order to do this, we need to be open and honest with God. We need to seek his way. We need to seek his will. We need not to seek ours. You know, this, this uh, psalm this week, I'm just going, you know, trying to live this out. I'm trying to live out, you know, God sees everything that we do. How do we respond to that? Um, it was hard. It was hard. Am I putting enough time into this? Am I doing it justice? Um, yeah, I was just searching motivations for different things that I, that I do. You see, this, this passionate plea, God wants us to, to understand that he knows everything, that he's in control, that he's every, ever pleasant, present. And for us, as believers in Christ, we need to open up to God, okay? But in that, we realize that we are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. You see, David earnestly wanted to be the best he possibly could for the work God called him to do. Seeking to have God work through him and transform him transform him in the person God called him to be. In this quest, we see that that David calls for God to search him. He's calling for God to know him and even try him. And the E word, examine him. And God calls, David calls for God to do this so that he is equipped to do the work God called him to do. Our earnest prayer this morning should be the same, to passionately call out to God for him to search us, to know us, to try us, and to examine our hearts. What is our response to the all-knowing, ever-present, all-powerful God. What's your response this morning? Our response, I believe, should be a passion for God, a passion that David had for him, understanding who he is and how great he is. We need to reach out to him just as David did. And by doing this, it will lead us to grow in our faith, motivating us to do our part, 
to cultivate the greatest relationship that we'll ever have, our relationship between God, our Heavenly Father, and us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Psalm 139 and all that it tells us. Father, we're thankful for David and his heart and his passion towards you. Father, help us as believers in Christ to have the same passion. Father, just know us. Father, search us. Try us. Examine our hearts. Father, help us to to lead a life that's pleasing to you. That from the very root, all that we do, think and say, come from you, Lord. Father, we're just so thankful for your word and your presence. And Father, we lift, the, we lift you up this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together as we respond to the one who loved us first.
Dan Yoder, and many people are sick in our congregation. Uh, truthfully, Stan was supposed to preach last week, and we had to do some jug- juggling because he was ill. And um, just be, please be in prayer for him. Uh, remember the uh, Christmas sing at, at uh, 6.30 tonight? And uh, as we go, I'll leave you with a, a benediction from Psalm 71, verses 4 through 6. Rescue you, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel man. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, my Lord. From my mouth, from my mouth, upon you I have leaned from before the, my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually, continually of you. Have a great day, guys.